Today's reading is Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 14. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honour, then honour. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be, are summed up in this one command, love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in the dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. All right, here we go. Romans 13. Let's pray and seek the help of God. Gracious God, thank you for your word. And Lord, we pray now that your spirit would be at work, as he always is. And we pray that he would help us to grasp the goodness of your word, to understand its instruction for our lives and ultimately how it points us to your grace and love in Jesus. And we pray this in his name and for your glory. Amen. All right, uh, this picture (coughs) of the world uh, shows you those countries in red where it's dangerous for you to be a Christian. You come to faith in those places Places uh, like in the the Muslim world, for instance, like Iran, Pakistan, Yemen, where there are blasphemy laws. Come to faith and you risk your life. Not only from your government, but in many cases from your members of your own family. What should you do? Should you submit Recant? Should you fight? Or some other way? Now you'll notice that Australia is not coloured red. We enjoy much freedom in our country, but that doesn't mean that there aren't things that sometimes happen. Let me introduce you to this gentleman. Uh, Some of you may know of his story, I don't know. His name is Jareth Cock. He was a doctor in Victoria, Australia. Five years ago, the Medical Board of Australia gave him the boot. Why? Did he act inappropriately with a patient? Did he engage in gross medical misconduct? Malpractice? No. What did he do? He expressed his faith-informed views on social media, on such things as children should have a mother and a father where possible. Men putting on dresses and growing their hair does not turn them into women. 
Killing unborn babies in the womb is a morally questionable practice. Marriage should be between a man and a woman. And they saw it fit to strip him of his license to practice. What should you do? Submit? Fight? Or some other way? Well, these are the kinds of questions that Romans 13 brings out for us and guides us in how we uh, approach life in a world where we are governed. And don't forget that all of this uh, from Romans 12 onwards, as Paul speaks on various issues about the Christian life, we, we live in view of God's mercy. We look to what Jesus has done and then that shapes how we are to live. Paul says we live lives of sacrificial worship. We live to the glory of God. And we do that wisely. Christians find themselves in all sorts of different political situations all around the world, from democratic freedom we enjoy here in Australia, to totalitarian dictatorships like North Korea, to the Sharia law of Iran. How are Christians to live for the glory of God as citizens in whatever country they find themselves in? Well, there are four things that Romans 13 guides us in. Uh, and the first point is going to be our biggest point. Okay? The last three are going to be relatively short and punchy. Because the first one is the big principle that we need to understand. And the second three are kind of the, well, then how do I do that in my day-to-day life? So the first point is submit wisely to rulers to the glory of God. Verse 1, chapter 13, Paul says... Rather bluntly, everyone must submit himself or be subject to, is how it's translated sometimes, the governing authorities. Really? Even for us who live in 21st century Australia, arguably the freest country on earth, we'll still flinch at that. Did Paul really say? Yes, he did. And what makes it even more astounding is that, when we, is that we remember Paul is not writing to a church in Coonabarabran of Australia. He's writing to a church in Rome at the height of the pagan Roman Empire who three years earlier, from when Paul wrote this letter in 57 AD, the 16-year-old Nero became emperor. Someone not particularly fond of Christians. And that's an understatement, by the way. So why does Paul instruct the church to submit? Well, two key reasons. One, it's right and it's wise. Firstly, it's right. It's right because, verse 1, and in case you miss it, Paul says the same thing twice, there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established, appointed, instituted, whatever your translation says, by God. Full stop. God is the sovereign Lord of all. He's the director of history. No king or government has ever held power unless God willed it so. This is what the early chapters of the book of Daniel are all about. You remember? Daniel finds himself in a foreign land, exiled under the reign of the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. And, what's, uh, and, and Nebuchadnezzar has this uh, rather strange experience of becoming uh, an animal who eats grass. And in this message that comes to him that warns him of this possible outcome in his life, the messenger from heaven that came to him declares in verse 17 of chapter 4 of Daniel, the Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of men. It's right to show the government the respect it's due by submitting to it because as a matter of conscience, we understand that the authority they have has been given to them by God. 
That's what Paul is saying. If you rebel against the government, you just might be rebelling against God. I mean, after all, we call Jesus the king of kings. Secondly, it's wise. The primary role of any government is justice, to keep society ordered by punishing wrongdoing. Verse 3, do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, right? That's simple wisdom. Wisdom that many still choose to ignore. Obey the law, you won't go to jail. It's that simple. Don't speed, you won't get a fine. Verse 4, the government is God's servant who works for your good in keeping you safe. That's why he bears the sword to bring justice on those who do wrong. Now, think about that. That's a good in our society, right? Without the threat of punishment, what would happen to our society? It'd be chaos, wouldn't it? Imagine a society with no government and the only sword is the one that you carry with you, which everyone else carries with them as well. That doesn't end so well. I mean, the American Wild West is called the Wild West for a reason. It was a lawless time. God's good plan is that some are chosen to bear that sword. We can't all do it. Think about, this comes off the back, think about how this comes off the back of what Paul says in Romans 12, verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. And that includes the agents of God's wrath, as Paul describes them in Romans 13, the government. The right and wise way for our society to function is that we submit to the governing authorities God has put in place. I mean, what am I? That's not a trick question, by the way. I am the what of this church? Minister, thank you. Right? Uh, The 151 people elected to the House of Representatives are the what? They're ministers. Have you ever wondered why we're called the same thing? Because, historically, it has been understood that we are both servants of God. That's what the word minister literally means. So, for you and me, let's not engage in that wonderful Australian pastime where we whinge about our government, but pray for it. Whoever wins at the next election, I'm sorry if it's not who you wanted, but that was God's plan. And and, and beside the fact, we live in Australia. No Australians are seeking refuge in a country in the Middle East. But plenty from that area are seeking refuge here. Here. We should thank God for the country that we live in. Don't complain if you get caught speeding. Submit. Pay the fine. Or better yet, don't speed. Right? If anyone thinks we don't need government, then they should feel free that when they go to the shops to leave their iPhone and their wallet or their purse in the front seat and not bother locking their car but we don't do that do we why because we know the world is populated with sinners and so God in his grace gave us government authorities those who punish the wrongdoers now the question that I am almost 100% positive most of you, if not all of you, are thinking is, is Paul saying that we submit to the government blindly in everything, no matter what? Now, at first glance, it kind of does read like that, doesn't it? 
And remember, he's not thinking about Anthony Albanese, he's thinking about Nero. The authorities that Paul has in mind were at best unfriendly to the church. At worst, they were maliciously and murderously hostile to the church. Paul isn't writing from an ivory tower either. He's someone who writes from the trenches. He knows better than anyone, save Jesus, what it means to suffer for the gospel. That said, the question, the answer to the question, do we submit to everything without question, is of course... No, 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 we don't. So the question becomes, where do we draw the line? How do we know? What's the wisdom there? Well, Romans 13, thankfully, does give us some fairly clear hints. Have a look at verse 4. Firstly, Paul tells us the government is God's servant. Now, a servant is not free to do as they wish. What must a servant do? Obey its master. In other words, rulers are accountable to God for how they rule. And they must rule in line with his will. Secondly, notice what it says in verse 4, that the government is God's servant for our good. And who do we look to to know what the good the government should be doing is? We look to God. He is the gold standard of good. And so if you like, the line is this. Does the government serve us according to God's standard of good? Now, there's still some wiggle room there, if you want to call it that. But that's a pretty good line for us to approach how we live as citizens of a nation. When we have clear examples of where God's people did not obey the authorities, for what the authorities were commanding was clearly not good. And again, we go back firstly to the Old Testament and to Daniel. And in chapter 2 of Daniel, what is he commanded? You shall not pray to anyone other than the king of Babylon. And what does Daniel do? Does he submit? No. He openly prays to the Lord. And then you have in the New Testament, for instance, Peter and the disciples in uh, the book of Acts in chapter 5. They're brought before the authorities and they're commanded to stop preaching about the risen Jesus. And what did they do? Oh, okay. Sorry, we we won't do it anymore. Of course not. So when the government is clearly ruling in a way that goes against that which God has declared good, we, as Christians, are free to say, along with Daniel and the disciples, I must obey God rather than men. And in doing so, and here's the thing to remember, of course, (laughs) we must be willing to bear what consequences may come. Now, we live in a democratic country with certain freedoms that we as Christians in the church should take full advantage of without breaking the law. Right? The responsibility of every citizen in our country uh, is to vote in line with what you believe is best for our country. And as Christians, what do we believe is best for this country and her people? The gospel. So we can vote and we can speak out in line with those values. Uh, this, uh, let me just take a quick aside to clarify something that often gets put out there in the public space. Uh, that when churches or Christians speak out on particular issues, this often gets raised. They talk about the separation of church and state. You ever heard that phrase? Yeah. They misuse that terribly. Because historically, what the separation of church and state was about was to keep the state out of the church's business, not the other way around. Because we, as Christians, even though we're Christians, guess what? We're still citizens. The idea that I can leave my Christianity at the door before I go to a voting booth is absolutely absurd. And anyone who claims that I should be able to do that doesn't understand a thing. If I should leave my Christianity at the door, 
my neighbour who's an atheist should leave their atheism at the door too. But they won't do that, will they? No. So we are free to vote and protest and, you know, critique our government, whatever shape it might take, in line with our Christian values. So we don't blindly obey, but with wisdom and with due respect, we can speak out and even rebel against any and all evil the government institutes. So in verse 5, Paul says that it is necessary to submit, not simply because of the threat of punishment, but as a matter of conscience. Now that word conscience in the Bible, when it talks about deferring to your conscience, it means using your God-given wisdom as guided by his word to make up your mind what is the right thing to do. And that's a crucial point. If the fear of punishment is your only guide, if the fear of punishment is your only guide, what's that going to do? That's going to lead you to obey out of pure self-interest. So you, you know, save your own skin. That results in submitting when it is clear that you should do no such thing. Conscience is the key. Our God-given conscience demands that we obey even when there is no threat of punishment because we do so in obedience to God. But it also means that we don't blindly obey when we can use our God-given wisdom to think critically and if the law requires us to go against our Christian conscience, that is not a good thing. We must, as a matter of conscience, disobey. Three examples. Christian school chaplains are in public schools. They are instructed, it is a law effectively if you like, that they are not allowed to share their faith and speak about Jesus unsolicited. If a student initiates the question, then they can respond. They can't bring Jesus up out of the blue, if you like. Now, should we as Christians go, oh, that's so wrong, they should be able to speak about it? No. Because that's the system that was put in place and the chaplains signed up for that, knowing that was the context in which they were going into. All right, there's an example of, let's submit. Secondly, abortion. There are exclusion zones now where Christians aren't allowed to either protest and sadly many Christians have not done so lovingly in the past, which is part of the reason why these exclusions don't exist. But even people are being uh, told to uh, remove from these exclusion zones, I think it's like 200 metres around an abortion clinic, because they might be praying. All right? Now, this is quite an issue. I don't know if you've seen this in the news recently, because there was a bill before the National Parliament, uh, the Child Born Alive Protection Bill. Right? This bill was voted down in our country. Now, this is a federal level. States have differing laws in place. It's a complex issue, of course. A small percentage of abortions that take place in Australia, about 2%, happen after uh, the baby is um, 20 weeks. But recently, Dr Elisha Broom, a chief abortionist in this country, said that they do this... You ready? On purpose, they let the baby be born of life to then let the baby die. They do it on purpose. She describes it as one method of abortion. That's evil. It's not simply an unintended consequence of a botched abortion, as many of us no doubt thought. But it's a practice. Now, I'm not saying it happens every day, but it has happened. A deliberate, calculated decision. So we're allowing something that's happening to babies that we actually outlawed to baby calves in 2022. Should the church speak out against this evil? Absolutely. Of course we should. Should you be the one to do it? 
Well, that's a matter for your conscience. The government doesn't force anyone to have an abortion. Abortion is evil, and we should recognise that, but there's complexities to the question that we should also recognise. And we can't, as Christians, be at the forefront of every single issue. We have to pick our battles. But collectively, as a church, of course we should speak out. Should you pray outside abortion clinics, even though you might be inside the exclusion zone? Well, if you feel compelled to, by all means. Although I will say the effectiveness of prayer has nothing to do with your geographical position. And if you do so, be prepared for the consequences. Third example, hate speech and anti-conversion laws. Anti-conversion laws uh, in Australia that have come in place, particularly in Victoria, a little less strict in New South Wales, where those who are practicing a homosexual lifestyle decide, actually, no, I want to change, I've become a Christian, that Christians aren't allowed to even pray for them, technically, in Victoria. And we can't say Muslims are wrong without being accused of hate speech. We can't affirm, pray and help people who are seeking to repent of that homosexual lifestyle. If the government starts to try and tell the church what she can and can't say from the pulpit and how we are to pastorally care for those who repent of their sin, well then, like Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms, when the Catholic Church was telling him to recant of the gospel truths he was teaching on the 18th of April, 1521, I think the church can do nothing but say these words. My conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand. I can do no more. God help me. Amen. Big principles. But... In our everyday lives, how does, it, how does that operate? How does the, the idea that we submit wisely to the government work? Well, Paul gives us three key ways that we can be careful to do what is right and as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. All right, and this next one may very well be my shortest ever point in a sermon because it's so wonderfully black and white. Pay your taxes. Full stop. Pay your taxes. Why, what stops some people trying to avoid, you know, paying their taxes? Why do we try to avoid it? Uh, in a show that I, I, I uh, watched called Parks and Recreation, it was a bit of a mockumentary about a government organisation. And there's a character whose name is Ron Swanson, who's decidedly anti-government. And in this scene, he says to everyone, hey, I've got a joke for you. The government in this town is excellent and uses your tax dollars efficiently. And then he stops, and that was the joke. <laughs> right, but, but we, kind of, we kind of want to agree with Ron a bit, don't we? Now, maybe we think, oh, I've earned it, it's mine. Hmm, we talked about this last week, remember? Where did everything you, come f- you have come from? It came from God. Or maybe you engage in that that, that, uh, other Australian pastime that complains about how politicians are paid too much. But if you ever had to live a politician's life, maybe you'd understand why they need to be paid what they're paid. They put in some incredible hours. And quite frankly, as a percentage, like when we look at the federal level, for instance, the percentage of the total tax revenue of our country that goes towards paying politicians is probably less than 1%. All right, God's word is clear. The government is his servant. Pay them their due. This includes respect, if respect, honour, if honour, and taxes. Does this mean we don't take advantage of the tax system to reduce our taxable income? Not necessarily. You're free to do as your conscience guides you in that issue. Within the bounds of the law, of course. But if you're reducing your tax income where you barely pay anything at all, okay, that's fine. 
But don't then whinge about the, uh, the state of our roads or public schools or the hospital system, the things that tax dollars go towards. Pay your taxes to the glory of God because all you have is from God and God commands it. There you go, point two. Love your neighbour to the glory of God. Paul continues in verse 8 to verse 10. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The law is summed up in this one command. Love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbour. Therefore, love is the fulfilment of the law. The ongoing way you and I submit wisely to our rulers each day, every day, is we love our neighbour. It always comes back to love in the Christian life. And here is Paul's point. The law of God and love, they're not rivals. They're actually one and the same. The commandment of God, the commandments of God, I should say, are all about love. When Jesus in the Gospels is asked, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus responds, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Love your neighbour as yourself. What's he doing? He's quoting the Ten Commandments. Because when you look at the commandments, the first four are all about loving God. And the rest are all about loving your neighbour. Love does no harm, says Paul. And God knows what we need better than anyone. He made us. And the law is God's way of saying, you want to love your neighbour and do them no harm? Well, here's a 10-step plan to do that. Don't murder them. (laughs) If you don't murder your neighbour, even when their rooster is crowing at 3am in the morning... You're loving your neighbour. Don't steal from them. Don't lie to them. Right? You love your neighbour by keeping the commands. And the law is, we should remember as well, the law is not just shall nots, but sh- should do's. Right? So when God commands don't murder, he's in effect saying at the same time, champion life. When he says, don't steal, he's saying, be generous. When he's saying, don't lie, he's saying, speak the truth. Breaking a commandment is always a failure to love your neighbour. We love our neighbour and our society and submit to the governing authorities by loving God's way. Keep his commands. Finally, we live holy lives to the glory of God. Submit to the governing authorities by living holy lives, by being the light of the world we're called to be. Or as Paul puts it at the end of this chapter, we clothe ourselves with Jesus. Now what Paul is not talking about at that point is what he has been talking about through much of Romans, the, the, the wonderful, glorious truth of our justification about how we are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. Although I'm sure it's at work in the background there. When Paul talks about, in Romans 13, clothing ourselves with Jesus, it's more in the sense in which he does in places like Ephesians chapter 4 and Colossians chapter 3. For instance, Colossians chapter 3 verse 10, he says, Put on, same word, clothe, the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge and image of its creator. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, right? that's Paul's way to the Colossians of saying, in view of God's mercy, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any, any one of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Put on, that word is the same as clothe. Clothe yourselves with Jesus. Because who had more compassion, more kindness, more humility, more gentleness, more patience, more forgiveness, more love than him? We clothe ourselves with Jesus. You don't turn up for a marathon wearing a suit and tie. It's not going to end well. No, you dress appropriate for the occasion. And what occasion should we Christians be dressing for? 
Jesus' return. That's Paul's point at the end of Romans 13. We live in expectation of when Jesus is going to return. We don't know when. The Bible doesn't give us some mathematical puzzle to to try and decipher, to figure out when that might be. No, we live as if he could come back tomorrow. Or maybe this afternoon. That's how Paul encourages us to live holy lives here and now. Look at Romans 13, 11. He says, and do this, understanding the present time, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than, we, than when we first believe. And that's true. Right? Your salvation, your ultimate fulfillment of being with Jesus forever is closer now than when I started this sermon. That's just true. And the way we we live with that hope in view is we remember where we are going because of Jesus and we remember who we are because of Jesus. Was Paul expecting Jesus to return tomorrow? Yeah, he was. Not because he had some special revelation that he that he thought he had, some special insight that that, that Jesus was going to return on Tuesday at 3 p.m. in Glanville. Don't know if you remember Glanville. No? Okay, don't worry about it. (laughs) Granville, I should say, not Glanville. Um, It was in the 90s where someone thought Jesus was going to return to Granville, Sydney. Anyway. um, (laughs) That's right. When you wake up uh, tomorrow, you're one day closer to eternal life with Jesus. That's the point Paul's making. That's how we're supposed to live with that expectation of his return. So if Jesus is going to return tomorrow, how are you going to live today? That's how we approach the Christian life. And and, and Paul's saying that you need to get dressed. (laughs) Clothe yourselves with Jesus. Live holy lives. Remember where you are going and that you are only going there because of the grace and mercy of your God. You brought nothing to the table. God sent his son into the world for you to die for you. That's why you get to be with him forever. Remember that. Remember who you are right now because of Jesus. You are one of his children, not because... You were special in any way that God went, oh, I really like what Christian's doing. I think I'm going to make him one of my children. No, it's actually the opposite. The only thing we actually bring to the table is our sin. If you like, our sin is what qualifies us for salvation. Remember who you are because of Jesus and his grace and mercy and love and clothe yourselves with him. And what do these clothes look like? Jesus paid his taxes. We've got an example of that in the Bible, don't we? Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Jesus loved like no one else on this earth. He welcomed the sinner. He welcomed those that the world was trying to tell him, no, stay away from them. And not only that, he willingly went to the cross for us. He suffered under the governing authorities. If you like, Jesus' submission to his authority of the day is our salvation. He didn't have to. He could have called down a legion of angels, like he says. He could have hopped off the cross if he wanted to. But he didn't. And he did that for you and me. He submitted to the authority of his his day for our salvation. Christ died for you. That is the truth that shapes your life. He is the king of kings. And he was crowned with a crown of thorns. He died for you. You. Individually. You know, think about it. 
I love this quote from C.S. Lewis, and I'm just going to paraphrase him. But think about it like this. If for some reason you were the only person to have ever lived in this world, God would have still sent Jesus to die for you. That's the love that shapes how we live. That's the love that compels us to live for the glory of God. Let's pray. Gracious and almighty God, we thank you for the good news, the gospel of the risen Jesus, that he came and lived for us and died for us and rose for us, our victorious king. And so we pray that the salvation he has secured would continue to shape our lives day after day as we live in eager expectation of his return. Help us, we pray, to clothe ourselves with Jesus. To live lives that wisely submit to the governments you have placed in power. Not uncritically, but wisely. Knowing when to speak out against evil. Knowing when to submit. That we would, to the glory of your name, pay our taxes. Love our neighbour. And live holy lives, all in view of the mercy you have shown us in Jesus, the grace that we know in the gospel of our salvation. And we pray this for Jesus' glory and in his name. Amen.